The market for hotels and hospitality is a very fluid one and very competitive, offering consumers a wide choice right from speciality historic inns, luxury hotels, down to more modest accommodation. The market is competitive perhaps for two main reasons. First, consumers have access to good information on prices, services and quality. And second, there are few barriers to entry. It's relatively easy to build a new hotel. So how can a hotel remain competitive and profitable given so much competition? Well, they can compete successfully, provided they make the right decisions about their products, their investment and their pricing. One of the ways in which businesses make good decisions is by using the knowledge that they've gained from their customers and using it often with hypothesis testing. A hotel may have a hunch, a gut feeling, that an investment in new facilities will enhance revenue and profit. But are they right? I've seen so many people have great ideas, but then they need maybe some evidence to justify a business case, or they've got a gut feel of th something they know to be true, but if they want to persuade someone else, maybe they need to quantify. So for example, we deal with clients every day who want to improve their customers' experiences in their hotel or in their car dealership. And it makes sense to improve those customer experiences because you're expecting the client to, the customer to be more loyal, to recommend you more, and, and as a consequence you'll grow your business. It makes intuitive sense that if we can improve customer experiences, we're going to improve profitability. That makes sense. Everyone feels that to be true. If you're going to make an investment strategy based on that, it makes sense to be able to prove it in a more quantitative way. You find best Western hotels all over the world. The hotels are independently owned. Best Western is a franchise. One of these independent hotels is the Boulder Inn. We compete with the other AAA Three Diamond uh, business-oriented hotels. A bulk of our customers are repeat guests uh, and that has everything to do with customer service. They've got a chain of a couple of hundred hotels in the UK, they've a thousand or so in the US, they've got hotels all around the globe. If you're going to upgrade your hotels, make some investments to improve room facilities or even the building facilities themselves, where would you put your investments? In order to improve their competitiveness, they commissioned research from Maritz to determine what areas of investment would yield the greatest competitive improvement. Maritz is a global research company that works with clients in many industries. Clients often come to Maritz with a hypothesis, something which they believe to be true. So said, we want you to talk to this lot and find out why they But in order there. to make informed decisions, they need some tangible evidence. Most clients are doing research to prove something. They have a gut feel about a relationship and they want to demonstrate that that's happening. They are validating some assumptions, some hypotheses. So Maritz begins with a client's hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. For instance, the client may believe that investing in enhancements to the room, linens, flat screen TVs, bathroom fixtures or facilities will enhance the competitiveness of the hotel, but will it result in increased revenues and profits? Yes, we understand that people want this and they want that and they want this. What is going to really help drive additional hotel sales? The hypothesis would be that such enhancements will do so. The alternative hypothesis is that investment may enhance the customer's experience, but insufficiently to enhance revenues and profits. When we have our hypothesis, the one we think is correct, the null hypothesis as it's called, and our alternative hypothesis, how can we test which is correct? This is Alcatraz, where they kept some of the most notorious criminals in the US until the 1960s. That's a principle of justice, that if someone is on trial, they're presumed to be innocent until they're proved guilty. So we have a hypothesis that says, this man is innocent, unless there's so much evidence against him that we change our view and say, after
after all, he's guilty. Now this is the principle that we use for hypothesis testing. We set up a hypothesis and we accept that hypothesis until the evidence against it becomes so overwhelming that we have to reject it. And we're trying to avoid two problems. We're trying to avoid a situation in which we reject the hypothesis when it's actually correct and where we accept the hypothesis when it's incorrect. If you like, what we're trying to do is to avoid a situation in which the guilty is found innocent or where the innocent is found guilty. So using that parallel, let's have a look at a test and see how we assemble evidence to accept or reject the hypothesis. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Richard Maxted. I'm calling from Merit's Research. Um, well, as part of an ongoing customer satisfaction research, we're looking to speak to people. Merit's designed a research project for Best Western and interviewed customers from Best Western and other hotel chains. We can use our analysis, our statistics, our research to identify what guests value and we can convert that to a certain degree into a monetary value. How much are they likely to pay for the benefit of having um, a pool or a fitness suite? We can look at average occupancy rates. We can look at the average tariff that people are paying for a room to find out the potential profit that could be gained through installing um, a fitness suite. And then we can talk with the owners of that hotel. How much will it cost for you to put that fitness suite in? and then start doing some return on investment analysis to work out whether it's worthwhile. What's the potential return if we put in a fitness suite compared to its in investment and in installation cost? Their study revealed the subtle differences between improvements that customer wanted but didn't significantly improve competitiveness and those that did. For instance, customers cared greatly about what's called triple sheeting where beds have inner and outer sheets that are laundered between guests. The perceived value added was $12.47 per night. Large screen TVs had a perceived value of about $20. A break-even analysis showed that hotels could recoup an investment in triple sheeting in 11 days and large flat screen TVs in 102 days. This information helped hotel owners to make investment decisions. But hypothesis testing is not only used in a business context. For instance, there are published figures that suggest that student debt is rising sharply. Education is expensive and more and more countries are shifting the burden of paying for higher education to the individual students. How much do you worry about the kind of debts you're building up studying here? I do worry about it, but I think it's going to hit home more when I finish uni. When you go to university, you're pretty aware of how much debt you're going to have at the end of it. It's sort of like relying on my student loans and maintenance grants to keep me going through the three years, really. And now hopefully <laughs> get a job out of it, I'll start paying it back. But um, yeah, it has been tough. As soon as you leave university, you're, you're faced with letters from your bank telling you, OK, start paying back. So it's throughout your life. So yeah, I worry about it quite a bit. Yeah, I think it's the sort of debt that you're going to be paying off for the next 30 odd years of your life, including the, like, the interest and everything. Some people believe that higher education should be subsidised by the taxpayers, and this is the case in many European countries. Others believe that since students get the benefit of enhanced earnings with a degree, they should also pay the costs. You're the ones that are gaining out of it in terms of a higher salary. Do you not think that you're the ones that ought to pay for it? Mm, that is a fair point, I suppose, yeah, when you put it that way. But, um, yeah. I don't think there's a problem about student debt, generally. I think students uh, complain too much about their debt. On the average, people who go to college do a heck of a lot better than people who don't go to college in every country that we have any data for. If they're going to do that well, why should the state be paying for it? Why shouldn't they have to? Uh, pay for it, take out debt the way they do when they buy a house and then pay it back over their higher earnings. So I think overall that's fine. Um, for people from poorer families, it's also fine as long as we enable them to borrow enough so that they can finance their education reasonably. And you may want to think of, you know, more 
a sophisticated financial instrument. So you pay back not a fixed amount, but a fraction of your income up to a certain point. And then some countries do things like that. So you can make it more sophisticated, but that students who are going to benefit from their education should have to pay for it either through directly out of their parental, their own money or, or, or borrowing, I think is absolutely the right way for higher education uh, to go. And to me, it's really inequitable to have the state pay for people who are going to be among the higher income members of society. I mean, why should the lower income people be taxed to pay for the higher income people? I, 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 couldn't, I can't see the sense of doing that. The published figures suggest that as a result, students are graduating with increased debt. But can we believe the figures? One way we could check the accuracy of the figures would be to sample a group of students. And suppose we do this and find that our sample of students has higher debt than the published figures. Does this mean that the figures are wrong? We can answer this question using hypothesis testing. Here's the particular problem that we'll solve using hypothesis testing. The data suggests that student debt on leaving college or university averages £18,000. We think it may be higher. So we interviewed 100 students on leaving university and found that the mean average of that sample was 19500 Now, of course, the debt varied greatly between the students in our sample, and we subsequently calculated that the standard deviation of that sample was £8,000. Is this evidence to suggest that reported debt of 18000 is understated? The first step in hypothesis testing is to specify the null hypothesis H0 and the alternative hypothesis H1. H0 is that mu, the mean average student debt, is indeed equal to or less than £18,000 and H1 that mu is greater than 18000 And we assume that H0 is true unless we found strong evidence that H1, the alternative hypothesis, is correct. The second step is to select a significance level alpha which is the level of scrutiny used for rejecting or accepting the hypothesis. The significance level shows the significance the test will have in terms of chance occurrence. For instance, if we use a level of 0.05, 5%, we're willing to accept a hypothesis even though it has a 5 out of 100 chance of being wrong. Now, although the choice of significance level is largely subjective, the rule of thumb is to use a 5% significance level, so that's what we'll do here. The third step is to calculate a test statistic, Z. And to do this, we use the following formula. That Z equals X bar minus mu naught over sigma over the square root of N, where X bar is the sample mean, mu naught is the originally reported mean, sigma is the standard deviation, and n is the sample size. This gives us 19,500 minus 18,000 over 8,000 divided by the square root of 100, which is 1,500 over 800, which is 1.875. Now the fourth step is to set the rejection region. To do this, look at the normal distribution diagram. Here we have a one-tailed test. We'll only reject the null hypothesis if Z is in the shaded region. We won't reject it if it's in the other tail where student debt would appear to be less than suggested by the official statistics. We need to put all of alpha in the right hand tail and we'll reject the null hypothesis only if z is greater than 1.96. The fifth and final step is to draw a conclusion about our hypothesis. 1.875 is less than 
so Z is not in the rejection region. Therefore, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We cannot conclude that the official statistics understate the problem of student debt. In terms of our analogy, we declare the prisoner still to be innocent. We can't be sure enough that he's guilty. Now look again at the formula. Notice that if our sample n was bigger, or the standard deviation of our sample sigma was smaller, z might have been greater than 1.96. You might try to find z if sigma had been 7,000, or alternatively, if the sample had been 144. In each case, your answer should be greater than 1.96, and we would then have rejected the null hypothesis, concluding that mean average student debt really was greater than £18,000. Now think about the hotel chain that we looked at. They thought that customers would pay $20 a night on average for a large flat screen TV. Now they had a sample of 400 where X bar was $25 and Sigma $10. So try to use the values to test whether the mean amount that they would be willing to pay differs from what the hotel chain thought. But be careful. Unlike the student debt example that we solved, this is a two-tailed test. When we ask what should be done about student debt, there are no universally agreed right answers. It's expensive. Someone has to fund it. Subsidising any student involves redistributing income. Is it right to do so? But if we understand the principles of hypothesis testing, we can at least see the size of the problem and get some idea of how reliable the data is. I think otherwise you're just going on gut feel. But if you really want a robust measure, something defendable, then statistics becomes important.